Someone's killed the president, an exclusive stops being resident, and the difference is evident. It's November 2003, and this is Yesterzine. Shovelware is dead in 2024, at least in the full price commercial release sense. The PS5 does not, for instance, have endless Imagine Your Agenda stereotype games, a trend that genuinely brought us everything from interior designer, to fashion stylist, to ice champion, boutique owner, gymnast, happy cooking, and just to really ram the point home to any young girl daring to get ideas above her station, dream wedding and babies. <laughs> the bottom of the PS5 Metacritic list is disappointingly average in comparison. 575th and last at time of writing is the Lord of the Rings Gollum. Not a classic to be sure, but difficult to describe as aggressively bad. In a disappointment for this show, Flashback 2, which we were looking forward to not long ago, crashes in ahead only of that and another zombified corpse of a once proud series. Shovelware existed alongside another trend that rising full price game budgets have largely killed the knockoff of a mainstream title. In late 2003, it was alive and well as we opened Games Master Magazine issue 139. The TV series had been dead for five years at this point, but the magazine wasn't even halfway through a run that wouldn't end until 2018. We're fully immersed here in probably the last generation where releasing a full price physical game didn't require a megacorp, and there are 22 of them across five formats released this month. In some ways it seems recent. The fight is on between PlayStation and Xbox consoles with very similar capabilities. Nintendo are off doing their own thing in both console and handheld form, just without yet thinking to combine the two, and the PC is just there doing everything the consoles can do, but slightly prettier. The PC is going to be a bit of a footnote in this episode though, Despite being the true home of shovelware and legally distinct titles thanks to being the one format without a higher power gatekeeping releases, it's not going to be needed for either of our two seemingly shameless clones of better games. But maybe there's a gem to be shoveled out of the trash. After all, while Mario Kart Double Dash is previewed this month, maybe we don't need it when we have Mario Kart at home. First though, it's new comic day. In the exact opposite of shovelware, this is a time a AAA game could take a risk. These days, the innovation tends to reside in at least the semi-indie end of the scene. Stuff like Against the Storm, Hades, or even Super Woden Grand Prix. The sheer budget of a AAA game these days means they all too often play things incredibly safe. It's how we ended up with someone turning the visual splendor and deep world of Avatar into a Far Cry clone. Alternatively, you just fill it full of games as a service bollocks and somehow blow the most sure thing gaming has had in the last half decade. And so to 13, a game so good it doesn't matter that you haven't played the first 12, an entirely original joke which, oh bollocks. We'll deal with the game in a minute, but let's go with the plot, because it's going to be important. You are currently accused of killing President Totally Not Kennedy. It's clearly a stitch up. The evidence consisting merely of you standing in a window in the direction the president was shot from while holding a recently fired gun. It could happen to anyone. The whole game will be presented this way, like an animated comic, and it's not just skin deep. Years before Hitman would properly adopt it, events are going to happen in picture in picture, and sound effects will be represented by lettering nearly professionally enough to have been done by industry legend and Dungeon Master of Honor HDE. Hire him today. There's a reason for this. 13's origins are as a comic series initially, and this game will represent the first five of its eventual 28 volumes, although it won't follow the plot of those verbatim. Less professional than the lettering is your approach to getting away with this crime, which is to wake up on a beach with absolutely no idea of who you are or how you got there. You are discovered by a member of Baywatch's B team, who recognises a bullet wound suspiciously quickly, but whose medical training suggests it's a good idea to turn her back and order the clearly concussed man to walk unaided across a hot featureless expanse of sand. 
This works out about as well as you suspect. A helicopter triggers a flashback that at least explains how you got shot, a wound which is about to be entirely forgotten about, and that's followed by you predictably keeling over like a British holiday maker after a novelty sized vat of Stella. Janet books you in for a complimentary cat scan and buffet and hands you a key she found while entirely medically going through your pockets. Even so, her getting turbo shot is a bit harsh and you get her back by nicking her throwing knife she somehow had concealed in that swimsuit. We make our escape and start to discover we're playing an early 2000s FPS. Commendably, it does support a twin stick control system you'd recognise these days, but regardless of how you set the controls, it's somehow both too sensitive and not sensitive at all. There's also absolutely no difficulty options and this is what it looks like with aim assist on. It doesn't help that fire is on R1 instead of the literal actual triggers too. The controls for the inventory aren't much better. Items are selected with the D-pad and used with a button distinct to the fire button even though you only appear to be able to have either item or weapon selected at a time. The game tells you to kill people with a single shot in the head but this is both near impossible and as it turns out actually wrong. Virtually everyone will require multiple headshots including this first guy. It's already sounding like I'm down on this game, but really I'm front loading the criticism. And in that vein, here's another one of it. You find the key to unlock the door, but somehow the guy outside can shoot you while you can't shoot him, meaning you are going to take several shots fumbling with the key like you've just come home from a night drinking with that British holiday maker. Even so, you can cope and it looks good, very good for a PS2 game. The style seems to suit the machine. And while it's not exactly an explosion in a fireworks factory, there is at least a vague effort to have a tiny bit more colour than was starting to become traditional around this time. We eventually escape the beach by first pretending we don't have a bullet wound that caused us to collapse not one minute ago, and by stealing our assailant's pickup truck. We decide the smart thing to do is head for the bank and see what the key does, the transition again done with a style that was well ahead of its time. Inside the bank, the manager recognises us and not questioning that piece of luck, we follow him to the vault, where he lets us in and just leaves. It does mean we can open the locker in peace, where we find… ah, it's my boombox! We all had those in the 80s! This causes a flashback of a mysterious woman who I'm sure is going to be an integral part of the story, mainly because she was in the intro. Like my 80s boombox? This one near immediately explodes, suggesting that it too is an Amstrad. While the manager hears it and audibly responds, he does not do anything so gauche as open the door to investigate the gigantic explosion, allowing us to slip out the back and sneak through the passages into the main bank again. Where security immediately decide to shoot us on sight. A customer. With a key. An explicit permission to be there. We though are still not allowed to shoot them. So what follows is a slightly awkward journey through the bank trying to non-lethally disable guards who will not give you the same courtesy. The game helps you out by again utilising its comic book tricks, like indicating where footsteps are coming from to give you a head start on your foes. At one point you even take a near pointless hostage. The guards won't shoot you if you've got her, so long as you're facing them, but they also won't leave you alone, so you end up having to punch them out anyway. Although that's how it works the second time. The first time I near completely failed to do so and it turns out the key cards aren't actually bulletproof. It's at this point the cavalry turn up, by which I mean those dickheads from earlier who have presumably caught the bus here. Those at least you are allowed to shoot, reminding me the controls haven't started making any more sense. The best I found was to leave them at the absolute lowest sensitivity, but even then it's sometimes too sensitive and sometimes barely moves at all. I also get lost many times before finding the emergency exit, at which point I'm arrested for the murder of the president. And not, for instance, for the at least 20 other murders I've committed in the last half hour, or indeed the theft of a pickup truck and trying to blow up a bank with an Amstrad boombox. I've probably used that thing to copy Spectrum games for my mates too. I'm history's greatest monster. We'll leave the story here as we meet the woman from our flashbacks because despite a lot of what I'm saying you are going to want to play this. It's got an astonishing atmosphere and the gameplay fits together tremendously well so long as you do exactly what I did next.
going better, this, isn't it? There's a reason for that. This is the PC version, available from GOG for as little as 79 actual P in the sales, and it plays like it was made yesterday. I've done exactly no configuration and the mouse controls are perfect. I'm pulling off those headshots with ease, which is why I know they don't work, and while it still insists on a separate use key, if you've played a PC FPS this century, you know which one it is. Do not, though, under any circumstances buy the 2020 remake. I've not played it, but the reason for that is the reviews are worse than the condition of 13's boombox after a trip to the Amstrad Repair Center. The controls are apparently wonky, and this entirely ruins the perfect looks of the original. Spend that 79p next sale or whatever derisory amount they're currently charging. It's about 8 hours long, and I'm a lot further into it than I've showed you. Unless something goes very wrong, and the game's contemporary reviews suggest it won't, this is an absolute gem that could be released today. As an indie game, of course. If Ubisoft did it now, it'd probably have an always online component that forced you to play in 4 player co op, as the copies of himself 13 is seeing thanks to that nasty untreated concussion. Grand Theft Auto is at this point pretty much a synonym for video game. It's the one your great nan would name, possibly even before Mario, Sonic and Pac-Man. Partly because it's taken them over a decade at this point, the hype train for Grand Theft Auto 6 started before we even knew it existed, and finding out it did, and was probably still three years away, didn't hurt that at all. It's even had the predictable backlash after the internet found out there might be a woman in it, and decided it was woke or something. It's the quintessential all-American game, something somehow not affected at all by the fact it's made in Scotland by the people who invented Lemmings. It didn't happen immediately. GTA was a footnote for the first half decade of its life. The 2D games got some attention, mainly for what was adorably considered over-the-top violence, and for their soundtracks that were shorter but at least as iconic as later ones. But they were, at best, 70% reviewed games. The PlayStation version of the first game took a year to reach a million sales. DMA Design didn't seem to really know what to do with it, first putting out a couple of 60s London themed expansion packs, and pushing some kind of gang warfare mechanic that no one wanted into the otherwise near identical GTA 2. And then GTA 3 happened. It all went 3D, and no one ever looked back. What people forget at this point though, is GTA 3 was a PlayStation 2 exclusive, and when it, understandably, blew up, Microsoft wanted in on the action. The most notable result of this being that a PlayStation 2 game in development as, and I wish I was kidding, Bling Bling, became Xbox exclusive Saints Row in 2006. This is why the later Saints Rows diverged so dramatically. The point of their original existence had gone. Saints Row 1 really, really wants to be GTA. The others got to be their own thing. Even by the release of SR1 in 2006, the exclusivity was effectively over, and it starts to happen here, some two years after GTA 3's release, and a year after Vice City. We pause at this point to contemplate getting two full GTA games in under two years. Another year down the road, a double pack of those two games is heading to Xbox for Christmas, which is a quite astonishing amount of game to get in one go, and for the price of a single release. Even so, that compilation goes to PlayStation 2 first, effectively representing a budget re-release for the pair. Still, what Games Master probably slightly hyperbolically call PlayStation's biggest exclusive is not entirely free yet. The next GTA, correctly rumoured to be GTA San Andreas, is apparently due the next year, with an Xbox port subject to at least some timed exclusivity. I'd entirely forgotten this. But a check of the dates reveals it did indeed pan out. San Andreas appeared in October 2004 on PS2, and as late as June the next year on Xbox and PC. That was the last exclusivity for the series though, probably because it had pretty definitively outgrown the willingness of either platform owners to pay the price that would be required. While Games Master speculated the proper follow-up, GTA 4, would likely be a PS3 property, in reality, both consoles got it on the same day, 29th of April, 2008. 
technically, as we all convene at the end of the first quarter of Space Year 2024, it might surprise you to learn we've not had a proper new Mario Kart game for a decade. Mario Kart 8, still the current title, was released in May 2014. Sure, there's a deluxe upgrade on Switch, although that itself is very nearly seven years old. There's a bunch of mostly recycled DLC for it, a freemium mobile game, and the novelty home racer for people with kids who never want to use their living room safely again. But still, we are massively overdue. The same could be argued of 2003. Mario Kart Double Dash turned up seven years after the last mainline version on N64. Gamesmaster are very enthusiastic about it in preview. Presumably, they will be reviewing it next month. But since that month contains dangerous amounts of the Nokia N-Gage, it should only be handled by trained professionals. And I am neither. Luckily, we don't need it. We've got our own Mario Kart style game reviewed this very issue. A beloved character from another genre gets a karting game? We can do that! We've got Bomberman Kart! This is going to work even better than Mario. Bomberman's already got weapons. We've got original Bomberman developer Hudson on the case. And it's not like Konami ever did anything wrong. Okay, so it's not like Konami did things wrong in 2003. This is going to be great. Mario who they'll all be say oh. 26% is not a great sign. Based purely on the intro, you'd be immediately fooled. This looks like a very nice little kart game. Missing some Mario charm, sure, but not exactly a disaster in any fashion. There's plenty of action. The player you're watching even goes off at one point and... gets stuck. In a pre-recorded intro. That's... not... ideal. And it happens again with the second one. I even double-checked I was running this at the right hertz, this being a PAL title in English, but no, it seems to be universal. The third character's demo intro is even worse as they just straight out nope out and disappear off the wrong way down the track. Some form of end of demo disaster happens for every character that has an intro. It's not spectacular enough to be a running joke or clever Bomberman reference, it's just broken. So we'd better try a race, I guess. Everyone takes off like it's last call at the bar and you're buying, but at least that gives us the chance to scope out what's going on here, especially as I am still frantically pressing buttons trying to figure out what things like fire weapon are. I won't master sliding until the next race, so let's concentrate on what we've got here. It's a mostly familiar experience, with a slightly more than average 12 carts in the race. A brave move for a game that appears to have a total of 5 very similar characters to work with. What does get my attention first though is the physics. This is not a pure arcade setup by any means. It's not a sim, of course, but it leans that way. You may be familiar with Moto Toon Grand Prix, an excellent kart game made by Gran Turismo creators Polyphony Digital as part of a deal for Sony to fund the first in that long running series. It features what is essentially a prototype of the GT physics model tuned for kart racing. If you've played that, then you're not going to be hugely surprised by Bomberman. It's not a sim, but it is going to make you slow down for turns. The carts do have some weight to them. It works well. More than most karting games, this is a satisfying game to just drive in. Another sim concession you'll rarely find in a kart game is Slipstreaming Works here, accompanied by an adorable little shaking effect, which will also be transmitted through your controller. It's a neat way of keeping you in most battles, and seems to have allowed Bomberman Kart to ease up on the absurd rubber banding which blights a lot of the genre, notably so in the case of single player in Mario Kart 8. It makes up for the fact that you could argue the game itself feels a bit slow. It doesn't have Mario Kart speed options, although the carts themselves do have different capabilities. Getting hold of the manual to check the above, it appears I'm using the lightest but slowest kart, so we'll kick that up in a notch after this full replay which is nice. Popping into the quick carts later, I don't notice a big difference. It's got a little more on the straight, and the slipstream seems to be even more important, but in credit to the game, you really notice the extra weight. It's not sluggish as such, but a tight turn is something you should prepare for in advance and perhaps pack a lunch. Mario Kart and its clones have an answer for this. Power sliding. It does exist in this game, but I'm still struggling how to use it. 
It certainly doesn't have the immediacy of a Mario Kart drift mechanic. It doesn't throw you into turns in the way that those games or Outrun 2 does. It could be a git good thing, but I've certainly not felt in my time with the game that it's in any way as universal or essential for progression as it clearly is at anything other than the very lowest level of most Mario Karts. Also essential for progress at any level of a Mario Kart are the pickups and weapons. I've not mentioned them before now because there's surprisingly little to say about them. It's not that they're bad, but they're a little generic and lifeless. You'll find broad analogues to the red and blue shells for instance. There's no green shell, but the green missile is a hybrid of both, having the kind of mild homing abilities that are about as effective as the average mild hybrid on a car, which is to say, briefly entertaining but ultimately helping in no measurable way. You can add to this a bomb, a turbo boost and a pleasing invisibility invincibility hybrid with the small trade off that you can't be picking up anything while using it either. There's notably none of the multi-use bonuses, but also if you're holding something a new one replaces it, unlike in Mario Kart. I like this a lot more than Gamesmaster did. I think they've made the mistake of reviewing it as a straight Mario Kart clone and in that respect it does fail, it's not quite that kind of game. It ploughs its own path with the complex but generally sane courses and a driving model that at least accepts the possibility of the real world existing. It's better than the absolutely broken intros would have you believe, and given the care that's gone into the rest of the package, the fact those remain in the game surprises me. I also, to be fair, don't think it's as good as Mario Kart, although Double Dash is probably the easiest target in the series in that respect. Edge defined it as the point Mario Kart became a party game rather than a racing game. It's notable that Double Dash is the only Mario Kart not to see at least some form of re-release on another console. Although, like all cube titles, you can play it natively on the Wii. Bomberman Kart is still a racing game. The Grand Prix mode is a single player only affair in fact and serves to unlock courses for the battles, time attacks and race modes that are available for multiple players but without AI. These are, if anything, more comprehensive than the side modes in most of Nintendo's games. This may not be as good a game as Mario Kart. You would still be getting laughed at by your GameCube owning mates if you had it although your average PlayStation owners would have plenty to clap back at in that respect. It is though not shovelware, not at all. It may be the Mario Kart we have at home, it may be the one your mates made fun of, but once they've gone, you'd load it up for a quick Grand Prix and you know what? Life with the PS2 wouldn't feel so bad at all. But there is another candidate in this issue. The PlayStation 2 generation probably wasn't a classic one for the Wipeout series. It was a standout of the PS1 launch lineup after all. It was arguably THE game that made the PlayStation mainstream rather than the likes of Ridge Racer and Tekken that appealed to those who already played games. Wipeout's 2097 and Whip 3 Out both pushed things on in their own way. Every Wipeout was an essential. Somehow this changed and I'm not even sure we noticed it did. The PS2 only got a pair of Wipeout games and one of those barely counts. Wipeout Pure was a PSP hand-me-down and it came out in 2009, four years after the PSP version, three years after the PlayStation 3 and six years after this issue of Games Master. It was an afterthought that Sony didn't even bother to release outside of Europe. Then again, our more contemporary example almost suffered the same fate. After being arguably Sony's biggest homegrown franchise on PS1, the PS2 release didn't even merit being Sony published in North America. While SCEE handled the Euro release, this American one was put out by short-lived publisher BAM Entertainment, whose lineup of mostly Cartoon Network licensed trash fires suggests that if the shovelware is going to live anywhere in this feature, it's going to be right here. All this messing about delayed what you would previously imagine to be a system seller by four months in NTSC form. Thankfully, while BAM distributed Wipeout in the young countries, they had absolutely nothing to do with the development of it, that being handled by serious creator Studio Liverpool, known to you and me as Psygnosis. While there's conspicuously no logo for the designer's republic, the general aesthetic they gave the earlier Wipeout games survives, 
with some well-chosen 90s electronic music that I've probably had to bury in the audio mix of this video in order to get onto YouTube in the first place, and an almost comic-like intro that stresses the names of the driver personalities more than Wipeout had traditionally done. This is an interesting move because it's bringing it closer to Nintendo's latter 2F0 games with their 30 named drivers and their pushing front and centre of Captain Falcon. These changes were not popular internally, especially with Colin Berry who would decide to essentially throw all that out for Wipeout Pure. Fusion is considered in some corners to be Wipeout's Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness, a next-gen debut so bad it caused the original developers to be fired from the series they created. So the door is open here for a knockoff, but I'm not taking that on face value so I put some time in to re-familiarise myself with a game that I didn't remember being half that bad. Fusion is unmistakably a Wipeout game even beyond the aesthetics, although not always for the best in first impressions. Wipeout was always a bit industrial in its looks, but that being the style of the time it's magnified here. It's mystifying to a degree that people thought this was doing F-Zero, because if there's one thing F-Zero GX does not suffer from, it's that. On the slightly muddy traditional PlayStation 2 resolution and with that colour palette, Fusion does have a tendency to be a bit blurry, and until I get used to this first course I completely miss one badly signposted turn more than once. When you do turn though, you're pleasantly surprised. Wipeout's an arcade game, of course it is, but its handling has a pleasing weight to it in a not dissimilar way to Bomberman Kart. In that respect, Fusion does not deviate from the other games in the series. It's not got the insane speed of the obvious competitors like F-Zero, and it doesn't need it. It does what a good Wipeout game should do, glide along like it's some kind of maglev wheelless craft. It feels, in a very good way, like trying to corner a bullet train. Where Fusion does struggle for me is the weaponry. I never felt it was a particular strength of the early games, relying on neon and lasers and never having much heft to them. Using a weapon in those early wipeouts all too often feels like you're playing laser quest rather than shooty high caliber ammunition. Fusion though magnifies this, some of the time I'm not even sure I have fired a weapon they're so weedy. It almost feels like the game might as well not have one, which is a problem because weapons are the thing that should truly distance it from the F-Zero games. There are pluses though, 15 opponents is a nice number and there's a full 45 circuits, tens of ships and apparently over 20 weapons, although I've just played this thing for some time and I think I could name you two of them. This is a proper wipeout package, but it doesn't have the same AAA feel of the previous generation titles and I'm not even sure why. Granted, Studio Liverpool were being very much prepped as the F1 studio by this point, a position they'd hold until that license expired in 2006 so it's possible Fusion didn't get the attention it deserved either in development or marketing. But I'd say there's room here for someone to out wipe out, wipe out. We've been talking about F-Zero GX but really it should have been the N64's F-Zero X because Fusion is 18 months older than GX. That game is indeed imminent but it's not the game we have in this issue. That is Extreme G Racing Association. And here's the light narrative irony. While Sony were getting BAM to release their apparently unwanted games in America, BAM, who at this point had a London studio, had signed a deal with Acclaim to release their games in the UK. In-house though, Acclaim were prepping their response to Wipeout Fusion. XGRA isn't a new series, like Wipeout it's the fourth, although unlike Wipeout, the originating machine here is the N64. Well, like Bomberman Kart, this is also the we have X at home choice, X is once again an exclusive. It's all very well saying you should buy Mario Kart, but Mario Kart was only on Cube. It's all very well saying you should buy Wipeout, but Wipeout was only on PlayStation. Unlike Bomberman, XGRA could be had on both Xbox or GameCube, but for consistency this is the PS2 intro you're watching here. It's a good intro. Electro soundtrack under atmospheric voiceover, plenty of racing footage. While XGRA clearly really wants to be Wipeout, at this point it's doing it better than Fusion does, and that will continue. XGRA at every point nails the atmosphere of the thing. You're going to see voiced over TV style track guides, you're going to get perfectly pitched background music and a little digging reveals why. XGRA is the work of acclaimed studio Cheltenham. 
You don't know them. There's no reason you should. But they were founded a couple of years earlier by a bunch of people let go from Psygnosis. These are people who know Wipeout possibly better than a lot of the people responsible for Wipeout Fusion. This does have one thing in common with Bomberman Kart. The demo shows the AI player screwing things up royally. I don't know if replays were just difficult back then or people outsourced their demo recording to the office parrot or something. But again, it appears, much like the United Kingdom, whoever is in control should not be. Is this what they expected to sell the game to people in shops? Maybe they're hoping people will be distracted by all the grey. XGRA is not immune to the rule that gaming in the 2000s was apparently legally mandated to be in monochrome. It was a dark time, in a very literal sense. It's more of a problem for XGRA because the other thing it is, is fast. Almost absurdly so, in fact. I don't know why people thought Fusion was aping F-Zero, because this really is. Impossible to perceive speed, roller coaster tracks, speed boosts all over the dang place. These futuristic motorbikes are the fastest riding things since your mum, and it's equally difficult to keep up with. The controls don't help with that. They're more sensitive than that guy in your Twitter feed, and you'll be side to side quicker than a happy hardcore remix of the Hokey Koki. Once you settle down, you'll rarely be using more than 25% of your stick's travel. Bomb diffusing requires less accuracy. Wipeout gave it an open goal on the weapon system, and XGRA just about takes advantage. Your first ship has a pleasingly meaty feeling cannon, although it takes a lot of shots to do anything with it. And there's a weird secondary weapon system where you have to pick your weapon with one button, fire it with another, and I'm never quite sure what most of them are doing except the entirely mandatory shield. XGRA also relies heavily on rubber banding AI, probably because at most you're restricted to just seven of them. I failed to work out the accelerate key for a good 10 seconds in my first race, but I'd still caught the entire field by halfway through, at which point they all magically learned to drive. When you do catch them, then they have voiced and animated segments to comment on the race in progress, which they mostly use to make fun of your little cannon. A man could get a complex. It's entertaining over a short enough timescale, but even my reasonably quick time with the game led to me maxing out the responses and them starting to repeat themselves in a way I suspect would get very annoying by about a quarter of the way through career mode. It's a good attempt though. While Wipeout tries to make something by having named opponents, it doesn't do anything with them as such, so other than names they might as well not be there. It doesn't even really make clear who you are racing at any given moment, something you can barely avoid knowing in this game. While Bomberman ultimately wasn't really We Have Mario Kart at Home, this really is We Have Wipeout at Home. While the handling models diverge and the racing is a bit different, this is transparently an attempt to clone Wipeout for those who are looking for more of, or indeed any Wipeout, on their system. And it's about as successful as you'd expect. This is not as good as Wipeout, and while it has a few good ideas, it's a little generic. Problem is, so is Fusion. It's a curiously lifeless entry in the series, and I can see why Studio Liverpool felt they had to go back to first principles when the chance to do a PSP version emerged. XGRA might well be the wipeout we have at home, but you might not want the wipeout we have in the shops either. On the back page, Turbo Outrun Reimagined. A mere 32 years after Tiertex didn't entirely succeed in converting the game for the home, Skid's team are there to do what Sega aren't. Turbo Outrun Reimagined lives up to its name. This is not a straight conversion of either the arcade or the original, featuring new cars, tracks and even nods to Super Hang On and the legendary original Test Drive. Reimagined already looks fab even in beta. And even forgetting the heritage, it's a fast-paced arcade game that should be on your hard drive. If you're not convinced, maybe watch Dan's tour of it on the Sega Guys YouTube channel. Also, subscribe to the Sega Guys YouTube channel, a time that would work better if I hadn't cut an entire section on a Sega arcade game from this episode. But never mind, join us last Friday in April for another magazine whose lifespan doesn't quite match Games Master. May your joystick always be gold.